He's ready to minister to you. Let's turn over to the 13th chapter of the book of Matthew. And you know, during praise and worship, I just really felt impressed to minister on something that I don't know I've ever shared it this way, but yesterday I had one of my Bible college students come up in the third year and he was talking about a friend of his he had over to the house and he and his wife, they were uh, fellowshipping with them and that they got to talking and one of them said that uh, God knew that Adam and Eve were going to sin and that all of this was planned and that God had already predetermined to uh, offer his son for our sins before Adam and Eve ever sinned. And he says, that's what this other student said. And he says, I just can't believe that that's true. And he says, do you think that's true? And I said, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> and I, you know, just quoted some scriptures like, I think it's Revelation 13, 8, where it talks about the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Before God ever created the world, he knew everything that was going to happen and he already had planned for salvation. None of this caught God by surprise. And as I shared this with him, he says, and he, this is a question that I've had too, and I really have struggled with this very thing. He says, if God knew that his creation was only going to last in perfection for just a very brief period of time, why would he have uh, gone ahead and done it? Look at all of the hurt and the pain, the people that'll go to hell and spend eternity in hell, all of the rape, the murder, the plunder, all of the terrible things that have happened. He says, why would God have done it if he knew that? And you know, I've struggled with this exact question, but I just shared with him something that I've thought myself often, and I, I don't know that I've ever shared this with people, and this is what I wanted to talk about, but here in a nutshell is what I believe God was doing, that God saw us and saw like when we were here pouring out our praise to you and worshiping you. And you know what? God thought that sacrificing his son, that all of the terrible things that have ever happened on the face of the earth, it was worth it for this morning, for you worshiping God. And the reason I think that we struggle with that, and I'm not criticizing this guy because I've struggled with the exact same thing myself, it's because we don't value us the way that God values us. We don't see how important we are and how much God loves us. And because of that, we see the hurt. We can relate to that very easily, and we recognize like the Holocaust and the millions of people that were... Uh, persecuted, the terrible things that are happening, we see that and we think, man, how could anything be worth it? If you knew that this was going to happen, how could you go ahead and give man free will and allow these kind of things to take place? But it's because God values us and values our relationship with him so much that you know what? All of the suffering that has ever happened that ever will happen is worth it just to get you. That is awesome. Look at this verse in here, Matthew chapter 13, in verse 45, it says, And again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking godly pearl, goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. You know, that scripture is interpreted many different ways, and sometimes people interpret that as this is the way we are, and when we find the Lord a pearl of great price that we give up everything we've got to make him our Lord and to worship him. And I think that that's applicable and that's the truth. But you know what? This also is talking about how God found us and we were a pearl of great price and God sold everything that he had, his son Jesus. And he gave his son and sacrificed his son for you and for me because he values you that much. And you know, many of us just struggle to understand why does God, why did God even allow his creation, this free will? How come he did all of these things? And it's because the love that we've expressed to God here today, God inhabits the praises of his people. In Psalms chapter 22, I believe it's verse 3. He inhabits the praises of his people. Zephaniah 3.17 says that the Lord our God will rejoice over us. He will joy over us with singing. 
And you know what? God is just, he is so, he loves us so much that from God's perspective, you are worth everything that he's paid to get you. I don't know if you can accept that or not. But if we were to ever get a full revelation of that, it would transform your life. You know what determines the value of something? Have you ever seen these antique shows where they bring something in and they bought it for a quarter and it's worth two, three thousand dollars or whatever? And it's amazing how different people put different values on things. What determines the value of something? It's basically whatever people will pay for it. If a person will pay for something, if they'll pay a million dollars for something, then that's the value of it. It doesn't matter what you paid for it, what you thought of it, what other people thought of it. It's what's the value of that thing in the marketplace. What will people pay for it? And you know what? God Almighty thought you were so awesome that he gave his only begotten son to die for you and paid for you. And that establishes the worth and the value of each one of us. And if we ever understood that, you know what? This would just totally, totally do away with any problem that you're facing in your life. It's because people don't have a relationship with God. They've never let God lavish that love on them and they've never fully understood and appreciated. That's the reason that any person is depressed. You know, I could go off in a million different directions right here, but let me just say that it's impossible, impossible, impossible for you to be depressed if you knew how much God loved you and if you had a revelation of the price that he paid for you and the value that he placed on you and how that he loves you so much that he would move heaven and earth. He would send his son all over again if that's what it took. He would do anything to redeem you. If you fully understood that, it would be absolutely impossible for you to ever be depressed. It can't happen. The reason people are depressed is because they don't know these things. And if they've heard it, they don't focus on it. Instead, they get focused on their problems and they get to thinking and anticipating all of the terrible things that are going to happen. But the truth is God loves you so much. God Almighty, the one who created heaven and earth, loves you so much that even though he knew that this world was going to go the other direction and give Satan this access and the terrible hurt and the pain, and all of the problems that would happen to people throughout all eternity, he loved you so much that he says it's worth it. And he gave everything he's got, sold everything he's got to be able to get you. Man, that would put a shout and a stump if you understood <laughs> that God Almighty loves you. That's awesome. I had one of our students come up, third year student, saying, I finally got it. <laughs> I've been hearing this, but it's about God loves me. It's about relationship. You know, Wendell Parr, he's one of our instructors here. He's over, where is he, in the UK this week? And he's not going to be here this week. But when he travels with me to our Gospel Truth Seminars, this is one of the things he always promotes about the school, is that we aren't just teaching doctrine. We're trying to get people to establish a relationship. It's all about relationship, not just doctrine, not theory. And it's all about relationship. And, and praise God, a third-year student took three years, but they got it. I said, well, praise God, however long it takes. That's great. But this is what it all boils down to. If you could ever understand that God Almighty loves you that much, it would transform your life. You're like this pearl of great price. God sees you worth sacrificing his son for you. Not just the human race collectively, but you individually. If you would have been the only one, God would have sacrificed Jesus just for you. Man, that's awesome. And if you understood that, it would just overwhelm. It would be like a tsunami. Here's your little tiny problem and this love of God would just overwhelm you. It would overcome any problem that you've got in your life. And the, the good news is that all of this is true, whether you know it, whether you feel it, whether you have a revelation of it or not. Did you know that God loves you that much? We were also singing this morning about throughout all eternity, I'm going to be praising God. And I thought, you know, that's true. And the sad fact is many of us are going to have to wait until eternity when we know all things, even as also we are known, to really start thanking and appreciating the salvation that we've got. 
But you don't have to wait until eternity. The Holy Spirit is given to us now to enlighten us and to reveal to us the love of God. It says in Romans chapter 5, verse 5, that the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. The Holy Spirit's job is to reveal these things unto us, to show us how much God loves us. And yet, sad to say, most people are focused on their problems more than they're focused on the good things that God has done for them. Religion has taught us so many wrong things that has made us think that God only loves you when you have done right. When you perform well, then God loves you. If you do something wrong, God will forsake you. God will let you die of cancer. God will put problems in your life. God will judge you. God won't answer your prayers. Boy, we spent a tremendous amount of time in this school trying to counter the religious traditions and doctrines of men that have made the word of none effect. And there's just many, many reasons that people don't have this revelation. But it is true that throughout eternity, when we finally know all things as, as also we are known, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, I can guarantee you, you are going to spend the rest of eternity praising God. And, and you can receive it now. You can begin to get this revelation now. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven. God has already done these things in our spirit. Our spirit, man, is perfectly in union with God. You're as pure, as holy, as righteous, as redeemed in your spirit as you will ever be throughout all eternity. You've already got the same healing power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead living on the inside of you. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. You've already got it. You don't need to pray and ask God to pour out his power in your life. You've already got Raising from the dead power, all you got to do is renew your mind to what you have and then it begins to flow out of you. People are praying and saying, oh God, give me joy. God, give me peace. The scripture says, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, and peace. You've already got love, joy, and peace. Your spirit is jumping up and down and doing flip-flops on the inside of you. And man, most of us don't even know what's going on in the spirit because we live in the flesh. We live by our emotions, by our mentality, and we don't know who we are in Christ. This is what the word of God is given to reveal. John chapter 6, verse 63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And this is how you tell what is true. You may not feel like you are worth a lot to the Lord, but this says that you are like a pearl of great price. God sold everything he had. He gave everything he had to redeem you. And you need to renew your mind and begin to go by what the word of God says rather than what you feel. Amen. Amen? Look at Jesus over here in the 12th chapter of the book of Hebrews. And this is how Jesus was able to endure all of the suffering of the cross. And again, I always try and point this out, that Jesus didn't just suffer during the last week of his physical life here on the earth when he was crucified and rejected. It was suffering for God Almighty to be limited to a physical body for 33 years. God, who is infinite, the scripture says that he holds the universe in the palm of his hand. Think about that. According to the Hubble telescope and everything that they tell us, the universe is infinite. They have never found an end to it. And he holds all of that in his hand. And yet God Almighty, who can span the heavens with his hand, entered into a physical body and lived in a physical body. And you know what? To me, that's suffering. To think that you could do anything, be anywhere, and all of a sudden you have the limitations of a physical body, and you walk by people that you created, and they don't even know you. They don't even acknowledge you. Even rejection would have been at least some kind of a response, but he walks by people that he created, and they didn't even notice him. And he lived in anonymity for 30 years. I just can't wrap my brain around that. Man, that is love that God Almighty would come. Here is Almighty God, Almighty God, who has all power, who came into this earth as a baby who couldn't exist without somebody helping him. Made himself dependent upon other people. I tell you, when we get a full revelation of these things in heaven, we are going to be overwhelmed overwhelmed with Almighty God and His love for us and the things that He went to to be able to redeem us. 
So he didn't just suffer on the cross. He suffered during the entire time that he limited himself to a physical body and got hungry and got tired and had pain and did things. That's just amazing. And here in Hebrews chapter 12, it tells us how Jesus endured the cross. In verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. But this tells us, this gives us a glimpse into God and how he operates and how he was able to do things. Jesus entered into the cross and faced being mocked, ridiculed, stripped naked, spit on, slapped, blindfolded, said, if you're the Christ, prophesy. Tell us something about who we are. He never defended himself. He never gave in to any of those temptations. How was he able to endure this pain and the rejection and all of these things, knowing that he was God? You know, if most of us, most of, I, I'd say probably every one of us, since we've had, since we're fallen human beings, Every one of us, if you had been in a situation like that, and if you could have called 10,000 angels, we would have just turned those people into a pile of ashes right then. <laughs> Man, when somebody blindfolded me and spit in my face and struck me and said, prophesy if you're the Christ, I'd have told them something, amen. <laughs> he could have brought these people to their knees in a heartbeat. And yet he never opened his mouth. He was like a lamb before his shears. He never opened his mouth. He never said a thing. How did he do that? Here it says that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of the majesty on high. You know how he did it? He wasn't looking at the suffering. He wasn't focused on the pain. He wasn't looking at those who rejected him. He looked through faith and was able to see you and me today here saying, we pour out our love on you. We pour out our praise on you. And Jesus looked at that and said, it's worth it. He looked at you and he says, you're worth it. And he endured all of his suffering and all of his pain because of his great love for us. Isn't that awesome? That's how God looks at things. And this is how he told us to look at things in the fourth chapter of the book of... Uh, of, um, where is it, Philippians, he says, if there's anything lovely, if there's anything good, if there's things of good report, if they have virtue and if they have praise, think on these things. God told us to do that because that's the way that he is. And you know, this is the way that God looks at you. Religion has misrepresented God, that God is just an angry God that is looking for you to get out of place just looking for you to take a step out of place. And boy, he'll, he'll hit you, he'll slap you, he'll reject you, he'll put some sickness on you, he'll punish you, he'll get even with you. And most of us have that kind of an impression of God. I've literally had people come up to me before when I was preaching like this and say that they saw God as a harsh being with a long beard bending over the rail of heaven with a lightning bolt in his hand just waiting on you to do something wrong. And man, God's going to judge you. That's the way that it's been represented. But that is not true. God looks at the good in you. You know, when he created the heavens and the earth, he, it says darkness was on the face of the deep. And he said, let there be light. And he looked at the light and said, it's good. He didn't look at the darkness and say, that's bad. He looked at the light and said, that's good. God looked at what he created and he said, it's good. He didn't look at what he hadn't created. He didn't look at the darkness. God isn't focused on all of your problems. God isn't looking for all of the things that are wrong with you. God looks at you and he says, perfect. And here is the real problem. And this is one of the greatest revelations that God ever gave me. I experienced God's love in a supernatural way. March the 23rd, 1968. If you come to this school, you will know that, that date before you graduate. 
You will hear it a number of times. You know, that's just what, a week away or something like that. It's been 44 years ago. God revealed his love to me and for four and a half months I was caught up in the presence of God. And I knew that I knew that I knew that God loved me. But after four and a half months, the feeling, the physical, natural understanding of it left. And then I was left to how do I adjust? How do I go back to being normal? After living in the presence of God 24 hours a day for four and a half months. And I didn't know how to adjust. And I spent 13 months in Vietnam asking God to kill me because I just figured that I could never get back to that place in this life. And I asked God to kill me and nearly died twice in one day in Vietnam. And I found out I really wasn't as excited about dying as I thought I was. So I just decided I'm going to have to do something to come through this thing. I can't just keep living, looking back, thinking about what used to be. And I didn't know what to do, but... Out of desperation, I just stuck my nose in the Bible and started reading the Bible up to 10, 15 hours a day, just studying the Word. And God, here's what changed my life was, I knew God loved me, but I couldn't understand how God loved me because I wasn't worth loving. There was things in me that I didn't like. Um, and, you know, I could spend a lot of time on this, but every one of us are aware of all of our faults and flaws, not only in the physical realm, but in your thinking and in your actions and motions and stuff like this. And so we have this problem when somebody starts talking about God loves you enough that if you were the only person on the face of the earth, that he would have died for you. And we go look in the mirror and we think, I just can't understand. Why would God love me? I don't love this. The scripture says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And unless you reconcile your thinking to the way that God thinks about you, you will eventually lose it. You can't go on just a feeling and emotion. I've had, his, I've had experiences with the Lord that I believe, uh, you know, parallel anybody's experience. And that I can tell you that if I hadn't have gotten my mind renewed and begin to understand some things, I would have lost it. I would have never been in ministry. We wouldn't have had a Bible college. You'd have never seen me on TV because I could not reconcile what I was seeing and what I felt about myself and what I knew to be true. I couldn't understand how a holy God could love me. And I just eventually would have lost that and I would have been actually worse off after experiencing that, having something dangled in front of me that I couldn't have obtained. I'd have been worse off if I hadn't got my mind renewed. But what the Lord began to show me is that it was in my spirit that I got born again. And my spirit is completely changed. And even though I can't see all of those changes in my physical body yet, my spirit, man, is totally, completely changed. I am as pure and as righteous and holy in my born-again spirit as Jesus is. Because it is the spirit of his son that's been sent into my heart crying, Abba, Father, in Galatians chapter 4. As he is, so are we in this world, 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. That we were created in righteousness and true holiness, Ephesians 4, 24. I am as he is, that we are joined unto the Lord. We're one spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, and on and on. And God just began to show me this. And now I can understand how a holy God can love someone like me because he doesn't look on the outside. He's not looking at the darkness. He's looking at the light that he created in my life. He's looking at you through who you are in Christ. When you accepted that salvation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says you became a brand new creation. Old things passed away. All things became new. And you are completely changed. You can't see that in the mirror. Some of you are just ugly. And you know what? You can't see this greatness and how beautiful you are in the spirit. You're looking on the outside. And then you search your mind and you think, man, is, is this perfect? But no, in your spirit, man, 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says that you have the mind of Christ. You know all things, 1 John 4, uh, 2, 20. You know all things, not some things, all things. You can't prove that by a test score. If you come to this school, I guarantee you, most of you aren't going to make 100 every single time and graduate never having missed a question. 
That's testing. We test your brain. But in your spirit, you know all things. And this just transformed my life to learn that in the spirit who I was and in the spirit, I have tremendous value. In the spirit, anything that I ever need. Some of you came to this meeting and you need physical healing and the truth is you've already got it. And you think, no, I don't. I got a doctor's report right here that proves that I don't have it. But see, you've got this report that proves that you do have it. By his stripes you were healed, 1 Peter 2, 24. And the rest of the Christian life is just renewing your mind and finding out what God already thinks about you. You don't have to do something to get God to love you. God already loves you more than you could ever comprehend with your little peanut brain. He loves you and heaven is going to be when you have all of the restrictions removed and you'll know all things, even as also you're known, boom. It's instantly going to be heaven. Not just because of the surroundings and because of a white robe and because of things like this. It's going to be because you will know what is already true. You'll know it. And to the degree that you can renew your mind right now, you can experience heaven on earth. This is what Jesus told us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. Pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You don't have to wait to heaven. We have to wait until heaven until we get the completeness of it because this physical body has to be turned into a spiritual body. Our mind has to be totally renewed. We'll never see 100%, but to the degree that you renew your mind and act in agreement with what the Word of God says, you can experience this supernatural power that is going to be manifest completely in heaven. You can experience it down here to the degree that you renew your mind to it. You've already got the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and you can raise people from the dead. We've got a man right here in this school that was raised from the dead last month in class. Is he here? Right here. There he is. Isn't that awesome? He died in this room about a month ago. Now here he is up, jumping up and down. That's awesome. Do you realize that there's only eight people in the Bible that were raised from the dead? From Genesis through maps? And we got one right here. I, my son was raised from the dead. I've seen three people raised from the dead. How many of you in here have seen somebody raised from the dead or you've been raised from the dead? Here's two over here. Anybody else? Another one. There's three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Man, look at this. We got more people in this room that have been raised from the dead than recorded in all of Scripture. Do you understand what's going on? God has already released His power and to the degree that you renew your mind, you can experience this life right here on the earth. You don't have to wait until heaven. And the only reason that people are struggling with all of the things that we struggle with isn't because God hasn't given it. See, this is where I believe most of religion has messed up is that they're trying to get God. They're praying, oh God, pour out your spirit. Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. Did you know that that's an Old Testament scripture? I believe Isaiah chapter 64, somewhere around there. Rend the heavens and come down. People pray that. I've heard that prayed in church. What's wrong with that is God rent the heavens and he came down through Jesus. And now on this side of the cross, everything has already been provided. You don't have to live holy in order to get God to love you. You don't have to do something in order to get God to heal you. You don't have to do something to make God bless you. God has already done it. We've got a man. Isn't that awesome? We've got a man in our Plymouth, Massachusetts uh, Bible school who's a preacher. And he just started our, our school there in Plymouth uh, at, in September. And I just got an email and the director of our Bible school there, George and Judy Appleton, told me that this pastor gave a testimony and just talked about how his whole life has changed. His whole church has changed. His whole ministry has changed. And here's the way he summarized it. He said, I found out I was preaching from the wrong side of the cross. <laughs> I thought that was great. I wrote them back and I said, you know, that'll preach. And that's basically what religion is doing is preaching from the wrong side of the cross. 
They're preaching like Isaiah, I mean, uh, Psalms chapter 51, where David says, Oh, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me and cast me not away from your presence. We sing that song. We don't sing that song, but <laughs> the church sings that song. And that's unbelief. That's a slap in the face of Jesus because Jesus created in you a new heart. He promised he would never leave you nor forsake you. He would never take his spirit away from you. And yet people come to a church service and say, oh God, we ask you to come and be with us. Stupid prayer. Stupid prayer. It's just how dumb can you get and still breathe? He says, where there's two or three gathered together in my midst, there I am in the midst of you. You know, I don't know if you noticed, but Daniel didn't spend a lot of time trying to get us into the Holy of Holies and saying we're entering in and doing all of this. We live there. This is something that's already a reality. We just started praising God for who he is, not for who he's going to be if we can do everything right and get him to move. I tell you, this takes a tremendous amount of pressure off of you to find out that God's already done it. He loves you and there is nothing you can do about it. You can't make him not love you. You can't offend him enough that he'll withdraw from you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Now you can reject it and if you aren't focused on it and if you don't operate in faith, you can go around depressed and defeated and sick and poor. You have the right. God's not going to force himself on you. But you know what? There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. There's things you can do that will help you to understand how much he loves you. There's things that the Holy Spirit can do to give you revelation, but you, you aren't changing God. God is who he is, and he already is passionate about you. If you're living in absolute defeat right now, if you're depressed and discouraged, God loves you just the same as he loves any person who is seeking God with all of their heart. The only difference is you don't understand it. You don't know it because the devil and this world system is going to do everything it can to blind you to the truth and harden your heart and keep you from perceiving and understanding. So you do need to get into the word. You do need to seek, but not so that God can respond to you, but you need to respond to him, what he's already done. Jesus, see, he looked at the joy that was set before him. He looked at us and thought it was all worth it. This is how you have to live your life is look at what God has done in your life, not all of the bad things. I was teaching in class yesterday. I forgot which, which class it was, but it was just last year that I was reading uh, Psalms chapter 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and I think it's the sixth verse says, Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever, or the courts of the Lord forever. What is it? The house of the Lord forever. And I was reading that, and I thought, Lord, I don't really fully understand this because there's not only goodness and mercy following me. I got a lot of problems. I got people that are mad at me. I've got things that happen. And I was thinking about people I minister to. They go through a lot of suffering and they go through hurt. And I said, how does this scripture square with what I see? And the Lord spoke to me and he said, I didn't say that only goodness and mercy follow you. <laughs> he didn't say only goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. He says, there are problems. There are, there are things that are wrong. But God has promised that goodness and mercy are with you every minute of every day. And you have a choice. Are you going to look on the dark or on the light? Are you going to look at who you are in Christ and what God has given you in Christ? Or are you going to just be a carnal person and look at things in the physical and go by how you feel and go by what your bank account says instead of what the Word of God says? The truth is every one of us have goodness and mercy with us all of the time. Sometimes it's more evident than others in the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm, 100% of the time, God is rejoicing over you with joy. He loves you. He's passionate about you. God gave everything he's got to get you and to redeem you. And you can either focus on that and be full of love, joy, and peace. Whatever you focus your attention on is what you're going to be full of. If you're depressed, discouraged, fearful, it's because you've been focusing on things that cause you to be that way. But every one of us in here also has all of the goodness of God. 
All of these awesome things that we're talking about, God has done this for you, and it's just up to you. What are you going to focus on? And you know, for those of you that are visiting, this is what really CBC is all about. It's a Bible school. It's not a cemetery. It's a Bible school. We've actually had students come to this school before who went to cemetery, and they never opened the Bible in four years. They read books about the Bible and theories and things like this. I had a pastor come to me not long ago, and we were talking about the Word. And he says, so which, which uh, the, I forgot how he phrased it, which theories or theological positions do you hold? Are you an Arminian? Are you a Calvinist? Do you do this? Do you interpret the Word in the light of this and this and that? And I looked at him and I said, I don't even know what all this stuff is. I said, I don't have a system over here, a doctrine, a theology that I believe, and I go to the Word and try and interpret it in the light of this. I don't have the encumbrance of all of that stuff. I don't have the hindrance of it. I just go to the Word. And if it says something, that's what I believe. And if that violates hermeneutics or whoever, <laughs> it's just fine with me. If it doesn't go along with somebody's theology, that's just fine with me. I don't care. This is a Bible school. And what we do is teach you what the Word of God says about you. And what it will do, it will change your focus from just the natural realm and what you see.
taste, hear, smell, and feel to see in who you are in Christ. You will get a revelation of God's love for you. And I believe that even if you have to be a third year student, you'll get it, amen. <laughs> and you'll go to understanding the relationship with God and how passionate God is about you. And once we establish that relationship with God, and once you get plugged into Him and receiving directly from Him, then everything else that you will ever need the rest of your life is available to you. Amen? And we just share some basics with you. And, and we don't share, like we, we don't have our instructors and say, would you teach this? Would you teach this? Would you teach this? You know what we do? The very first time we got together and started this school, we started in 1994. And in 93, I got together the people that were going to run this school. And we sat down and he says, what do we do? How do you have a Bible school? What's a Bible school? <laughs> what do we teach? And you know what? We didn't sit there and assign something or go. We just said, what is real to you? I talked to Wendell Parr and I said, what is, the, what is your life message? What has God spoken to you? And he began to share. And I said, well, then you just teach those things and you develop them into classes. I talked to Don Crow. What is the real thing that's changed you? I teach the foundational things that have changed me. And we have the instructors here just basically teach what God has done in their life and what is real to them. So the people aren't just, it's not just mechanical. It's things that are working in their lives, things that have changed their life. And we have assembled, I believe, the best group of instructors any place on the planet. I really believe that. And these are all people that have an experience with what they're talking about. It's not a theory. It is a revelation. It's changed their life. And we've only invited people in that we have relationship with, that we can see it working. And you know what? We don't all believe everything exactly the same. There are some differences. But we're all moving in the same direction. There are minor differences, and I can guarantee you that every single person here has got something for you from God. It'll just transform your life. So again, I want to thank you for coming. This is going to be awesome. I'm going to be sharing a lot. I think I've got four other times or something like that that I'll be ministering. I'll be getting into a lot more detail. But this morning, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to share with you that He loves you so much that he thought all of the things that it cost him, his own son, all of the suffering that this world has ever gone through, all of the pain, everything is worth it just for us loving him and giving back the praise and worship and honor to him today. Man, that's awesome. God sees you differently than you see yourself. God places a huge value on you. And if you were to ever get into agreement with God and understand that, I guarantee you it would change your emotions, it would change your actions, it would change your whole outlook on life. And that's what we see happening. We see students that come in here one way and leave another way. I mean, it just changes you. I've got a teaching out entitled Effortless Change. I don't know how many of you have ever seen that or heard that, but you know, there's teaching on effortless change. It's, most people think change is traumatic and it's hard and it's, it's difficult. That's because they're trying to change contrary to what God said. That's because they're praying that, that God will change things, but they aren't doing what he said. The word is a seed. And you just plant the seed in your heart and that seed will germinate and it'll begin to start producing fruit and change will come effortlessly, just like a plant produces things. You've never seen an apple tree. You've never walked by an apple tree and heard it just moan and groan and, ah, and boom, here's an apple. <laughs> an apple tree just produces apples. It's its nature. And you know what? If you would get into the Word and learn who you are and what God has done, you would just change. You'd find out that depression, discouragement would leave. Fear would leave. Faith would come. You would have joy and peace. The anointing would flow. Things would begin to happen. The word is health unto all of your flesh is what it says in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 or 22. It, it just produces healing. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destruction. Psalms 107, 20. 
The Word of God would just change you if you would let the Word of God take root on the inside of you. Not just do it one hour a week and then spend the rest of the week living in the flesh, pl uh, uprooting that thing, and then go back the next week and plant it for another hour. You've got to get to where they just live by faith. They don't vacation there. They live there. You live by faith. It just, you focus on God. And when it's your meet day and night and you are focused on it, you'll find out that it just brings forth fruit effortlessly. And this is what happens in this school. For those of you who are considering coming here, I believe every one of you should come. I really believe that. And some of you say, well, I'm not sure about that. Well, I am. <laughs> I can guarantee you it wouldn't hurt a person. I don't care if you go back and, you know, just, or a housewife, you go back and you, you know, you're a garbage collector the rest of your life. You will be the best garbage collector that they've ever had. You will minister to people. You will touch people's lives. I guarantee you, sitting under the word, preparation time is never wasted time. And I don't care what you're doing or what you feel God has called you to do. It's good for you, and it would transform your life, and it, and it would give you a greater revelation of God's love for you. It would increase your relationship with God. I guarantee you, you'd leave here stronger than horseradish. <laughs> It'd transform your life, and I make no bones about it. So glad that you came, glad you checked it out, but um, I just believe this is going to be a life-changing time for you. Let me pray for you. I just got a minute or two, and I want to pray for everybody that you get what it is that God sent you here for this week. Father, I thank you for bringing these people here this week. Thank you for touching people's lives. And Father, I know that people are here to uh, discern what it is that you want them to do. They're checking out this Bible college. And Father, I just pray that the Holy Spirit would penetrate any barriers, any hardness of heart or anything, that any questions and fears that people have about how can I do it and what about the finances and all of these things. Father, I pray that you would just speak to people, penetrate all of these barriers and that they would hear your voice. And we believe that we are your sheep, that we hear your voice and that we will follow. We will not follow the voice of a stranger. And Father, we love you and thank you so much for loving us that you sold everything that you had to redeem us unto yourself. We thank you and we believe that the Holy Spirit is giving us a revelation of that this week. And Father, even during these three days, we will be transformed by understanding the goodness of God. And Father, we thank you. We open up our hearts to receive that. And we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Awesome.